What's up? This is Ethan Levy of Famous Aspect, and today I'm going to be talking to Brad Wardell, the CEO of Stardock. You might know him from series like Galactic Civilizations, Sins of a Solar Empire, or Fallen Enchantress. Today, Brad and I are going to be speaking about the role of DLC and the beneficial role DLC has had in the growth of his studio and his publishing organization. And while we talk, I'm going to be streaming the prototype of Offworld Trading Company, the game currently being developed by Mohawk Games and published by Startup. DLC has a bad reputation because it deserves a bad reputation it has. It's kind of like early access where here's something that is a wonderful tool that has been ruthlessly and often incompetently misused. And DLC is that way too where it's obvious that they pulled stuff out of the base game to put it as DLC to get an extra nickel or diming out of the consumer. And that leaves a bad taste in people's mouths. So I wanted to start off just to talk a little bit about what developing a game or publishing a game looked like before DLC was a big thing. And I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about either in a general case or maybe in a specific case for Stardock, how a team size grows and shrinks over time as it's being developed. Sure. Well, let's start with uh, DLC and what it was like in the old days. And in the old days, you would release your game at retail. You made pretty much all your money in that first 90 days. And hopefully that was enough money to cover the cost. And if it wasn't, you basically went out of business. If it made enough, then you either went around trying to get your next project going and would make an expansion pack, which would be, again, sold at retail, to help keep your guys busy until you got your next big project. But expansion packs didn't sell very well back in the day compared to the base game. And that was not good for anyone because if you're a consumer, if you're a gamer and you're into a game, DLC can keep that game going and keep it fresh. And if you're a developer, that DLC can help pay for ongoing updates to the game. I know it's fairly common at that point you just talked about where you release the game and you need to immediately start bringing in, you know, you have 90 days to kind of determine success or failure. It would not be uncommon to have to lay a bunch of people off because your team had grown bigger in the months up to release to finish it. And then... Oh, pre-DLC, you laid... Before DLC took off, you laid off lots of people. You had really no choice for most studios. DLC changes that. Were there any instances at Stardock where you had to lay people off post-launch or where you were in danger of losing talented people if you didn't sign that next deal real quickly? No, but most of that is because of Stardock's weird uh, setup. That we have most of our money has traditionally come from non-games, from desktop software. But I can tell you that if it weren't for DLC, there would be no Stardock at all today. There wouldn't be Stardock in any form. That wasn't called DLC back then, but in effect it was. Stark was founded back in the early 90s, and I made a game called Galactic Civilizations for OS2. And that was sold at, at the store, and it made millions of dollars, of which I got it exactly zero. Because the publisher took the money and then filed for bankruptcy. And I was a college student. I couldn't even afford a lawyer to go and try to get some of that money. So I basically ate it. And the only reason why I was able to continue Stardock at all was because I made a little downloadable, so downloadable content, so to speak, addition to the game called Shipyards, which allowed people to design their own ships for galactic civilization. And that made enough money to act as a seed capital to do everything else. Oh, wow. I didn't know that part of Stardock's history. Yeah, that was, that was the actual source of income that allowed me to keep Stardock going. Without it, I would have had to shut it down. I'm curious, kind of headcount wise, what's the biggest game that you guys have worked on? Well, it's tough because at Stardock, we, we don't have dedicated teams. We have an engineer, we have literally an engineering team, an art team, and uh, you know designers and that, but they get moved across various projects depending on where they're at in the project. So there's almost never just a particular team. But I would say, I mean, our games are small. We probably have never topped more than 18 people that are on a particular project at once. Is there a point where DLC really kind of came into its own as an important revenue source and point of planning for Stardock in general? I would say it was, it was during uh, Legendary Heroes. Fall Enchantress Legendary Heroes is when it really took off, where the original game came out in 2013, I think. It did well. It got an 80 Metacritic score. It, it's a pretty good game. 
But there was so much more we felt we could do with it. But and in the old days, there was just there's nothing we could do. We could either make a Fall Enchantress two, which while the game would did well, it didn't do well enough to justify that. Especially since the choice was between doing work on Fall Enchantress and working on Galactic Civilizations three, it was a no brainer. The team was going to work on Galaxy three. So what we came up with was, you know, if we could release DLC, that would generate enough money where we could do free updates to the game itself. Because users on the forums would constantly, uh, you know, list off things they wanted in the base game, and we were happy to put those in, but those engineering hours have to be paid for. And so we funded that through DLC, and that in the end made the game richer because no one would have argued that the base game should have have had the DLC we had. It was there were things we completely came up with after we shipped, and then that allowed us to do things like improve the AI, put new interfaces in keep optimizing performance, having all kinds of nice little tweaks to the game. So not only were the players who were buying that content benefiting, but every player who was playing Fallen Enchantress benefited because you were able to support the base game at the same time that you were developing downloadable content. Exactly. Even if you didn't buy DLC, you still benefited because we were able to put out... I mean, we just put out, I think, uh, Legendary Heroes version 1.8, I think in December, last month, right? And that's like we're going on two years since it shipped. And it was not a non-trivial update. It wasn't like, hey, we fixed a little bug here. It's like big improvements throughout the game that made the game substantially better from a feature perspective. But it was paid for by this thing called the Battlegrounds DLC. So thanks to that content and thanks to those sales, you've been able to really do a great service to your fans, whether they ever buy that DLC or not. So like two years of development or live support. And the way it was done, it's actually made us closer with our community because we didn't hide this at all from the users. We, we made it real clear that the last DLC did well enough. I would actually kind of do mini reports and say the last DLC did well enough that we can do 104 engineering hours for the next update. So what do you guys want? <laughs> and then people would submit their stuff. And that's a, that makes everyone feel really good because they don't feel like they're getting nickel to dime. They, and, they, and they can see from the previous updates that they get meaningful stuff. Like we're supposed to put out a new version of Legendary Heroes this spring. And it's going to have two things uh, in it that are really exciting. One's going to have a new tactical battle AI, which is going to make them poop because it's just so much better. And two, and this is going to be a big deal. There's going to, in fact, I, I can't wait to see what happens to a lot of classic games. This is going to be a real issue starting next year. 4K monitors are going to start popping up, right? What happens when you start running your games at 4K? Anything that is a pre-rendered asset will look like crap. It'll look tiny, right? It'll look ridiculous. So you can already imagine what's going to happen. So uh, the, the new version of Legendary Heroes is going to have this new UI system that's it's going to have a high DPI support. So two years post-launch, you're able to provide for free support for the latest technology for your audience. No one's going to ever claim that we should have imagined two years ago that 4K monitors were coming out soon. I mean, that was crazy. They, they just popped out, and here they are. And without this update, as a practical matter, Legendary Heroes would be very hard to play. Thinking about it, I could see downloadable content having a number of different ways it's really important one would be just from the planning and operation side of running a studio and how you manage who's working on what and manage the low manpower needs of certain projects versus high manpower needs. One would be the revenue piece, like how important it is for just making a profit or a continued profit on a game. And one would be a morale piece, both for your team and for your players. I couldn't put it better than that. That's I think you nailed, you've you just nailed it perfectly. People don't realize we love what we create. I always feel like a bit of our souls end up in these games. And I, I, I'm not very spiritual, but some part of me is left inside that game. And that's not a bad thing. I, I look at it, I go, oh, I remember working on that. It was fun. And it pains me when I have to move on. But now I don't have to really move on. And it allows me to create a much more stable environment for our developers because if I have too many scripters, now I have a plethora of games. And I can say, you know what, why don't you make some DLC for this game? And I don't have to worry about laying someone off. And it'll make the fans happy. I mean, let me give you an example. If we announced the Sins of Solar Empire DLC right now, people would be very excited. I wish we could, but I don't have anyone to do it. But it, that would be a welcome thing by the community. From your perspective running a studio, does that increased job security you mentioned result in better games? 
Oh, absolutely. This has been a big theme since we set up uh, this thing called a PEO, a professional employment organization. And it's one of the more radical but boring things startups done in the industry that uh, it won't get a lot of coverage because it's so boring, but it's a pretty big deal. And that is, we have a basically a half dozen game studios besides Stardock that are under the covers. We all work for one conglomerate, so to speak. And they're called PEOs. And it means that if Mohawk has artists available, they can work on a mothership game. And if Paul has some free time and he doesn't want it to lay off one of his guys, he can send one of his guys to work on a Stardock. And DLC, though, makes it a lot easier. Because it's because it's one of those things that scales. There's an economy of scale to it that the more games and the more DLC possibilities there are, the more options there are for us to put a developer on something and not have to uh, lay anyone off at the end of a project. So as a hypothetical, you know, one Soren and his team at Mohawk deliver off-world trading company, uh, say that Soren and wants to, you know, just him and, well, I actually know him. Let's say he wants to go off in a closet by himself and start prototyping his next game. And he's got a staff of six or eight other guys or how, however many developers it is. They may, may be lent out to your other studios to help develop that aforementioned Sins of the Solar Empire DLC, for instance. Right. Or, or Star Control, for example. Right. I mean, we... Even as is, I mean, we're able to, it's, it's been a, a major benefit to be able to get art direction on Game X and, and loan a, um, artist for a few weeks there on something else. But, uh, yeah, absolutely. That if Storm wants to go and prototype his next game and he has this development staff, well, that's okay because that team could go and be working on, um, something for Oxide's game or, or something that Bonus XP is doing. So what, what was the name? You said Professional Development Organization? Was that? Yep, PEO. Uh, do you have any, instead of future hypotheticals, present anecdotes of how that's been put into effect or how that's been put to good use? Oh, absolutely. Taking a one step back, if you look at Stardock or Mohawk or Oxide or Mothership and there's other studios that aren't announced yet, they are all small on their own. But under the covers, we're a PEO, which means that we can get much better health insurance, much better benefit for everyone, and there's no transferring or weirdness going on. It's almost like we're all one big company, but we're not. We're still independent companies. Uh, here's an example. Sorcerer King is coming out. Well, Offworld was in prototype for a long time. So at the beginning of the project, we had a couple of his guys were on star control and a couple of his guys uh were on sorcerer king one of them was on galsiv and one of them was on like an unannounced game as a result that gave soren a time to be able to prototype stuff without worrying that mohawk was gonna was just burning right you, you've heard the term burn rate in terms of tech companies right yeah the, and burn rate is one of those things that kills a lot of startups but for the peo your burn rate isn't a uh absolute anymore your your burn rate is variable because you can offset it so under the covers they end up all paying each other for for services but essentially they they have a lot more control with their burn rate than they did before so to help explain just how important controlling your burn rate is i'd like to talk just quickly about the costs of recruiting so from my experience as a hiring manager and team lead at EA, recruiting is extremely expensive, both from the direct costs and the indirect costs. So direct costs are paying recruiters or posting jobs, and indirect costs are, are the time that it takes, that is extremely time intensive. So I'm curious what the experience is like at Stardock with what the costs are or how time intensive it is to recruit new people. Well, it is. You're exactly right. And this is something that most people are completely oblivious to is that the higher up phase of a project eats up because recruiters take 20, 30% of their quote unquote salary. So if you're a startup, first of all, you don't want to have to recruit any more people than you have to, which means that you need to have the minimum amount of turnover. One of the reasons why it's so volatile is that there's an incredible churn rate with it. And one of the things that we've been trying to combat, and this goes way beyond, the PEO is one piece of this, 
the DLC is a big piece of it too because that creates a more stable revenue resource. But another one is just making sure that you know the working environment is much better. Like we don't, we actually forbid crunch time now, and I mean it's just not allowed in the in the company. And this goes to the PEOs that we strongly discourage even our uh, affiliate companies. And the reason why this is important is that if you walk around to your, you know, well, you're at, you're at EA, how many of those guys were in their 20s and how many of them were in their 30s and 40s? Right. I would say that the average age of all the people physically in the studio, uh, you can map it over the course of a day. Once it hits five o'clock, the average age of who's there goes down tremendously until... You know, by two in the morning, it's me, a stressed out 30-year-old project lead and like two drunk 22-year-old engineers. Right. And what happens, though, is that over time, because of the churn and the work environments and that sort of thing, you end up with losing a lot of the high-end talent. And one of the things that we're very proud of is that when we're at GDC and we're unveiling all these new games, all the studios combined, other than Stardock, have less than 100 people, which is less than, say... You know, Dragon Age, way less Dragon Age Origins. And yet the production values and the quality are right up there. And the reason for that is the average age of an engineer on one of these projects is mid-30. In fact, I'm not sure if there's any engineers on any of these teams that's younger than 30. Which is, that seems crazy, right? It's like, that's backwards. And yet the way we're doing that is that we're going out of our way. So when we, which gets back to your recruiting question, is that when we recruit, we're specifically going after veteran developers, and our promise to them is that if you come here, you can tell your wife and your kids that you're not going to get laid off at the end of the project. You're going to have a stable environment. You're going to be paid well. We have obscene bonus plans, and it's just it's a much more stable environment. And as a result, even though they cost a lot more, there's a great Steve Jobs quote where he points out that a great developer can do 25 times as much as an average developer. But that t- would take 25 guys to produce this much. And I don't know if that's 25 is a lot, but I can say that on these games we're doing, I mean, if people saw how small these teams are and what they're producing, it's just amazing, whether it be on the, from the art side or the... And the same thing, by the way, on the art side, is that they're all you know, old, a little bit older than the industry norm for that same reason. So to tie that back into the importance of downloadable content, because of the money you make off of downloadable content, combined with the flexibility of your uh, organization, you're able to keep people employed and not have to hire as much, which means that you have more money to spend directly on the game. Right. Here's a weird, I mean, people outside the industry would probably don't probably won't realize how big of a deal this, but Stardock has only had to lay off game developers once in its history. And that was when Elemental shipped, and the probably pretty obvious why, because it was, you know, kind of, kind of a disaster. But that was five years ago. And at one time in 20 years is pretty unusual. And even though we're going to be releasing six games in the next 18 months, six new, you know, 1.0 games, I don't expect to have to lay off a single person. Yeah, that's, that's remarkable. And where that helps is, as you said, the veterancy of the team. And then also, you know, as a team lead, when we had, let's say, 10 open recs, 10 open, 10 job openings on my team open at once, or even five, I could be spending between two hours and four hours a day on the various parts involved with recruiting. So all that time I could have spent producing, making sure the game was at quality, making sure people know what to do. I was instead spending, you know, recruiting resumes and writing job posts and doing phone screens and just trying to get people on my team. Yeah. And well, if you have a really good working environment that people come to you, we've had to do very little recruiting. There are certain, other than like for special, like QA, we have to recruit still pretty hard on. Um, but art and engineering, the word gets out in the industry. I mean, people, at first they have to usually come and see for themselves, right? They have to, they hear about stuff and they go like, oh, come on, it can't really be, you have to have crunch time, right? Like, no, what about the, you can only hear about the bonuses or some other thing we have. And then we end up with resumes. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of keeping teams together and how keeping teams together over long periods of time as you've been successful in doing at Stardock results in better game quality? It definitely helps. It definitely helps on the quality of the game itself. I can't really say it on morale because it's morale seems pretty good no matter what. But 
I never realized how much I relied on that keeping the team together thing until we did uh, Elemental. By the time we got to the last Gal Civ expansion, I was basically doing my quote unquote design on a on a single piece of paper, and, and because everyone knows what they're doing. I mean, well, if you play Gal Civ three, the the crazy thing is that it has all the people who worked on Gal Civ two, except for Carrie, who went on maternity leave. But all the people who worked on Gal Civ one were on, that were on Gal Civ one are on Gal Civ three. Plus, you know, there's new people too, but it's a superset, right? We we the turnover has basically been zero. And all those years. And I mean, we've been making that game for years. And as a result, the production and design is so much easier because everyone knows what it's like. You're, you're looking at it and go, no, 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 no. Drenching would never do that. <laughs> or, you know, oh, that ship, uh, that ship. Everyone can basically do things that uh, don't have to be spelled out. Whereas on new IP, that is a, that is, we're doing a lot of new, new IP this year. And it is, I'm reminded how easy Gaussif is by comparison in that one that one respect. So a feature near the end of Gaussif 2's uh, expansion content, you as you said, you can write out a one pager about a feature and trust that your team knows you and what you want and the community and and the game enough to see it through at quality. Whereas uh, when you were developing Elemental, uh, which you said was kind of a, a shift in in terms of um, the veterancy of the team or, or how long the team had been working together. What what was the uh, feature design and implementation process like on that? How did it uh, contrast? Well, I, I mean, I did about the same level of design effort on that as I did Gal Civ, which is not a lot. Mm -hmm. um, not nearly as much as... In fact, I didn't really understand what was truly involved in game design uh, until John Schaefer joined us because so, he did an actual, actual game design. Like, oh my God, there's like pages here of, of stuff and uh and that's been really tough for, for me to get used to and on elemental basically what i had gone to the team is to, is to say i want master of magic multiplayer with better graphics and then i left to work on sins of solar empire and demigod and stuff and then but the team all went in their own directions because there was we didn't even have a producer so that game had no producer and the designer was you know not even on the game you know, I, I was on other stuff. Then I come back and it's like the game had all kinds of crazy stuff because one person took it as, well, we should have underground dungeons because uh, Master Magic has these worlds, uh, multiple planes and stuff. And another person took it in another direction. And, and so it was just all over the place as a result. I know s something I've seen is um, where junior members get a chance to prove their ability and their leadership ability and become leader on, on core products thanks to working on, on DLC that's viewed as lower stakes. So I'm curious if um, there are any current leaders in, in your studios now who paid their dues on, on a DLC product. Oh yeah, our top uh, producers start out doing all the Sins DLC. Chris Bray, who's the producer on Sorcerer King and on an unannounced project simultaneously was hired in to do the Sins DLC for us. And we've had developers that started out on that as well. And then one of the interesting things that's come up, this will start percolating, I think, in the next year or two, is that I actively recruit from online. And a lot of the content and assets I'm bringing in actually are starting to come from, from the game community. And it's almost a separate topic entirely. But a lot of the, like, uh, one of the things we ran into and this is an interesting uh, downside. To, remember how I was just bragging about how all of our guys are veteran developers? There's one huge problem with that, and that is we're all very expensive. And that means there is no one to just do the, well, I hate to say grunt work, but grunt work. And, it, and that bit is in the butt with Sorcerer King because we, so uh, I hired uh, Chris Buckles, who works on, uh, he's a comments at cracked.com to do all these quests. And they are amazing. And we had hundreds of them. So how do we turn them in? How do we get the quests in the game? Well, I would be doing this on the weekends, right? Like, okay, copy, paste, editing, you know, into XML to get into the game. Like, this is insane. So I went on Twitter and I recruited a bunch of techies and put them on a Skype channel and gave them access to Google Docs. And, and we divvied it up and then said, here, I'll pay you X dollars per hour to do that. And then we've started hiring people from this pool to work on stuff as in become an actual startup, well, or whatever the closest studio is. From this. I'll have to, um, something I, I imagine I'll want to write about in the future is that community development angle, and especially with things like Steam Workshop. Like, uh, I know there's a studio here, Unknown Worlds, who I think uh, they released a natural selection 
expansion or content that was entirely community created, which is pretty pretty awesome. Well, I got one that's really weird that's happening right like as in yesterday. The uh, so Galaxy's Edge Two was released nine years ago, and it has an active community. And they've been putting together, they've been doing these mods and stuff, and there's a lot of little things that they feel were wrong with the game. And, they, and they're right. I mean, they're, you look back and you go, yeah, that's a bug, that's an AI bug. They're just things that you just, that kind of got glossed over at the time. And uh, so I said, you know what, why don't we uh, take your mods and we'll go ahead and make an official update. And we're working on, with the community, to create an official update to Galsip 2, which is a nine-year-old game. And so some of the updates that they need require me to go into the code and make the changes too. I mean, so basically, the community is my boss, <laughs> right? Because they're telling me what I need to go do, and then I, I, I'm their, I'm their engineer, right? They're the producer, I'm the engineer, and I, they assign me what I to go do things and to do to help them put together this update. And that's, I think that's kind of the the future too. Is where in the age where we can all be sharing uh, with cloud storage and documents and stuff, what's the stop? Uh, the next generation RPGs or whatever to have vast community update stuff where you combine that with Steam Workshop and uh, uh, where people can actually will be able to sell their own stuff on Steam Workshop eventually. I think that's uh, that's really funny just that where it used to be you would say in the past theoretically the community is your boss you work for them you're making the game for them. This is an instant where they are actually your boss. They are. I mean, it, you should see it. And I, I mean, they send me, there's, uh, so we have a Google Drive and they share the documents and we, we collaborate on this Google, on these Google documents on, okay, here's the next thing we're going to do. Here's your change log. These are the, pri- they prioritize it for me. They you know, nail down the things and I'm in the source code fixing it. And I submit them a new build. I check in the source code. I submit a new build to them. They tell me which things that worked, which things didn't work. Yeah, as a former modder myself, it's kind of a dream come true to finally be able to go, yes, we're able to do this together. This is awesome. All right. Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time. You've been very generous already. Uh, just uh, want to ask if you had any closing thoughts on um, kind of the role DLC plays in uh, game quality and at Stardock. I would say for consumers, even though some companies have abused DLC, as an overall, it's the best thing that's happened for game development because it's going to allow people and fans to keeping keeping their game allow them to keep their games new and fresh and improving over a long period of time and at the same time they i think there's a lot of people who, a lot of the hardcore fans are, are have some awareness of how crummy the game industry has been to uh the people who work in it and that dlc is probably more than any other single factor improving the quality of life of working at a game studio awesome thank you so much all right thank you it was good to talk to you good to talk to you too Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, please subscribe for the latest inside look at game development. As always, you can follow me on Twitter at Famous Aspect or go to my website, FamousAspect.com, for all sorts of videos and articles on game development.